Welcome to the fourth season of Coming Out and Beyond LGBTQIA Plus Stories. This is Anne Marie Zanzel, your host, and I am so excited to share some changes to our podcast that are really great, and I think you'll be as excited as I am about it. First of all, we will be dropping a new podcast every other Friday. This is at the request of our listeners who wanted to hear more. Secondly, my producer, Barb Rowlandson, will be joining me as a conversation partner as we discuss things coming out. Barb is a fellow late in lifer and also the mom of a queer kid, and so she has a lot of insight and experience to share with us. And thirdly, we're going to be focusing also on the beyond. Love to hear your coming out stories, but I want to hear the beyond. Sometimes magical things happen when we come out and we have a life that we could have never imagined. Many of us say this is the best thing that we've ever done. So let's get started. Welcome to the show. Tell me your story. Today on my podcast, I have one of my favorite people, and that is Barb Rollinson. Thank you. Hello. For those who, of you who follow my social media content, you know Barb already. She is my podcast producer, and she helps me with online content, and she's a late in life lesbian like me. Yep. Barb and I have covered lots of topics together. We've discussed divorce, we've discussed the impact of coming out, we've discussed grief, we've discussed dating, Mm -hmm. but the one thing we haven't touched on yet, and we're going to cover it today, and I'm so excited to talk about this, is that Barb had a catalyst. Yep. I know. (laughs) So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the term, it is a term that we use in our late in life community. A catalyst in the context of queer relationships is an event or someone who wakens you to the realization that you might not be quite as straight as you thought you were. Sometimes it's a major life event like a death, um, an accident, a divorce, um, getting sick and recovering that causes people to reconsider their sexual and gender orientation. Sometimes a catalyst can be a person, like you have a crazy crush on an actor or a musician or someone else in the public spotlight that you feel attracted to and you can't stop thinking about. But most often, a catalyst is someone you know and see in real life. In science, a catalyst is when a substance accelerates a chemical reaction. In the lesbian world, a catalyst rapidly brings up feelings of attraction. A catalyst relationship may or may not be requited. It doesn't always result in an intimate relationship, but for many it does. Mm -hmm. And Barb, in your case, (laughs) you had an intimate relationship with your catalyst, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. (laughs) So Barb has told our story, her, her complete story before on season three, episode two. So if you want to hear her coming out story, you can find the link in our notes for the show. But this time, Barb, tell me the story of your catalyst. Well, look, Amory, if we're going to get really real and hindsight is 2020, my real catalyst was Katie Lang. <laughs> And especially, do you remember that photo that she did? There was like a- With Cindy Crawford? Yeah, I, oh I know where God. you're going. <laughs> that photo shoot, that, that photo made me gay, for sure. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it, it's like for the people that are younger than us, that those, the things like that were the thirst traps of the 90s. Oh, for sure. And like that was, I mean, that was sensational at the time that that had come out. And I think oh, it probably was the first time that I had seen a representative a representation of um sexual attraction okay. between women that was sort of held up and uh celebrated rather than right. vilified so it really sticks out in my mind as a moment because i would have been a young teen at the time and uh i remember like everybody was just agog at how sexy that that photo shoot was 
And I kind of remember like I uh, being absolutely fascinated with Katie Lang and her, her, her uh, gender um, like expression and how sexy it was and wanting to be Cindy Crawford. <laughs> Did you want to be Cindy Crawford or did Cindy you want to be done by Cindy Crawford? No, no, no. I, I wanted to be the Cindy right. Crawford. In that oh, Cindy world. Crawford. That's right. That's right. I'm getting confused. Um, so we're going to put a link of, into this picture in the show for all the people that didn't see it and all the people born after this magazine was um, published. But I, you know, it's a very significant photo and I remember it as well. Mm -hmm. um, as for so those of you who don't know Katie Lang, first of all, we are guests, but <laughs> Katie Lang is an incredible singer. She's from Canada, like Barb, and she's a butch lesbian. She's super butch. Um, and an extremely sexy. You know, Tonda has a Katie Lang story. She was in West Hollywood. For those of you who don't know, Tonda's my wife. She was in West Hollywood one time and she was, she went into a restaurant with some friends and Katie Lang was in there and she had three women sitting on her lap. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky ladies. Lucky ladies. Lucky ladies. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I imagine with just how, like, her confidence, her, she, she really stepped into her sexual identity in the 90s, I think, in a way that nobody else was really doing at the time. And I can remember, like, I can remember my dad, who was very LGBTQIA friendly for, you know, that his generation, for sure. Um, I can remember him saying he felt so sad because he was, he thought that her career would be over when she came out. Ah. It yeah. was not that he was so sad that she was gay. He was so sad that he thought, you know, her career would be over. And of course, happily, he was wrong. Um, not only, I think she became more famous and, uh, you know, she became more famous, I think, after she stepped into her authenticity and did some amazing work. Um, so, okay. so, okay, so we can I, stop talking. I'm about stop, <laughs> Barb, or this will be Ode to KD Lane. <laughs> Podcast because I have a couple other Katie Lang stories because, okay, this is the last thing. She started her career here in Nashville. Mm -hmm. She was a country music singer. They did not know what to do with her. I bet. I bet. Yeah. I'd like, and, it, and we should also post the picture of her in this country music dress and stuff like that. She just, she defied what was expected of a woman in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like when we talk about the Indigo Girls and stuff like that, they had a real, not real, like sort of femme look for, they were like, quote unquote, acceptable, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, in their look, but Katie Lang was not. And so... The funny thing is, I'm glad your father was wrong, and we are going to hashtag Katie Lang all over the place. Yeah. Oh, you bet. Yeah. Absolutely. Maybe we'll get to talk to her someday, Barb. I think I, you would fangirl her. And I, I, I'd I, I might faint. I don't know. Maybe I'd just <laughs> faint into her lap. Like <laughs> okay. so like, oh, I, oh, I fell. <laughs> but, you know, like to sort of tie it into, um, you know, talking about my in-person catalyst, I would say that that probably set me up for a lifetime of um, sort of a, a, an underlying attraction for women who expressed themselves like in, in their clothing and their demeanor and their style. Uh, that was uh, women who presented a little more on the masculine side. Center, yeah. Yeah. It really, um, it set me up for a lifetime of just really being attracted to women like that. Um, but I, I didn't quite connect the dots between um, sexual attraction and like I just it didn't the, the two the pieces didn't connect for me right away. For me, I always interpreted it as admiration. Mm -hmm. I admire her. Mm -hmm. Oh, I really admire her and how she's so distinctive and so like, you know, so because of course, at the time, I, I wasn't gay, I couldn't be gay. Mm -hmm. You I, were married. I was. Two kids. I was married. married. I had kids. I'm not. I'm not gay. But, but I'm, I'm an ally. Really admire her. <laughs> but I really admire her. So tell me the story of your catalyst. So, um, so my catalyst actually 
you know, was on my radar before I had even met her. She was somebody who lived in my community. Um, a lot of just by virtue of uh, her position in the community, a lot of people knew who she was, including me and the work that she did. And I admired her. She was a very much I wouldn't say she's, uh, you know, she was a, a super butch lesbian, but she was definitely more presented more in like male clothing. She would wear suits and bow ties and she was very dapper. Mm -hmm. she wore hair, that kind of thing, a little bit older than me. And um, I admired her from afar. I, I really thought she was somebody who was doing great work in the community, which she was. And um, I really wanted to meet her for a long time. I had seen so like, how did you meet her? Well, we met in an award ceremony and we had tons of friends in common. And, um, you know, I had said to two friends who came to the award ceremony, like, you, you know her, can you please introduce me? I'm just dying to meet her. I admire her so much. And we were up for the same award, I think. It was a, a, a women in the community kind of mm -hmm. awards awards thing. So I, I met her. I, I was introduced to her actually by two different friends. And um, we hit it off right away. We became friends right away. Um, and what started with a friendship eventually over months transitioned to some deeper feelings um, on both sides. She kind of confessed her feelings first, but uh, I remember at the time I was like, "No, no, I, I, I I'm not doing. I'm, I'm not gay." <laughs> Meanwhile, I would go home at night and lie in bed and think about her. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. um, I had come from and that. Goes, ex I'm, uh, excuse me for a second, but that goes to the old adage: straight girls don't lie awake at night wondering if they're gay exactly i i think they, just, they might do it one night <laughs> or two nights i think it's very normal for young you know college people to think about that stuff but it's not something that you think about over and over and over and over again mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you're you're laying in bed you met this fantastic woman you 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 admi you're still admiring her I was still admiring her. Um, you know, it wasn't until many months later that she confessed to having some feelings, but I was like, well, no, no, that's, that's not possible. And that, that came after I had confessed to her that I felt like I had to leave my marriage and that, that didn't have anything to do with her, but the two events kind of coincided pretty closely together. Um, I, had, I was in a marriage for 21 years where we were you know, and I, I don't wish to speak disparagingly about my ex-husband, but I, I do feel like we were very disconnected in many, many ways. We were in a, I felt very lonely. I mm -hmm. felt, um, that's why you have so much time for your community. Well, you? there you go. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was lonely. <laughs> I felt like, you know, there was, there was hardly any in intimacy. Um, and, um, I thought like, I think, I feel like we both sort of did our own thing in the same house where he would play video games and I would do art projects or play my guitar or go to open mic or just we would fill our own time and never really be super connected. It was like we were both living on this uh, in, a, in a state of disconnect and that was for a really, really long time. Mm -hmm. So um, I had actually uh, earlier that year for the May long weekend here in Canada, we, my, one of my very dearest oldest friends and my sister and I took a road trip to Nashville. Mm -hmm. And um, my friend who I traveled with uh, was a, a counselor and a funeral director and grief counselor. And we had about 16 hours in the car together. And that's when it sort of came out. Like, I, I don't think I can stay in this marriage. Like when is right to leave? When is it right? When the kids are done high school, it, when they're off in the world and getting married, like there's never a good time. So I had kind of decided like enough was enough. I was 45 and how much longer would I like to wait to be happy, to find mm -hmm. happiness? And it was after that trip and I came home and I, I talked to my catalyst who was just a friend at the time and I said you know I don't think I can stay and then at some point after that she was like I have feelings for you and I was like 
no, I'm not gay. <laughs> <laughs> but when I thought about it some more on those nights lying in bed, I realized that, you know, I couldn't stop thinking about her in that context. And what would that be like? And in fact, she had started dating another woman. And when she had told me about it, just like friends do, like gossip, hey, you never guess, I went on this date. She had told me about it. I can remember lying in bed and being wildly jealous, jealous wildly yes. jealous. Yeah. You know, flag. <laughs> you may, may not be straight when you get really jealous when your lesbian friend or a friend that's starting to explore this begins to begins to date and all of a sudden you go I want that to be me this was it I was well, like, kind of fun. Was... we're gonna call those lavender flags and I'll tell you ask me at the end why we're calling them a lavender okay. flag okay. okay okay so yeah so um you know it was some time after that when I worked up enough courage to say you know yeah yeah I would try this with you um and um you know, and we did. And it was I had, I had kind of transitioned to to living with my mom at the time it first started with like, sleeping on the couch a lot speaking sleeping in the spare room. And then it was like, I'm, I'm just gonna go because mm -hmm. I'm not happy. Mm -hmm. And we're separated. And, um, and that's when I started to explore um, this relationship with her. And at first, like so many catalyst relationships, it was earth shatteringly sexy like, oh my gosh everything all the things Anne Marie. Yes. <laughs> it was magical it was wonderful it was unlike anything i'd ever experienced before um and it wasn't just about like finding sex. a set wasn't just about sex although the sex was like entirely different than anything i had ever experienced before well yeah because women know how to make love to each other right? and so you know, I think I tell you, if you're an enterprising lesbian and you teach some straight men how to make love to them, there has got it. Maybe that's maybe that's a course we can work on together. <laughs> that's <a> business bar. <laughs> call it finding the doorbell because quite yes. frankly, <laughs> ringing the bell. <laughs> like, seriously, guys. Finding the pearl. <laughs> pearl coaches. <laughs> like okay getting real guys this okay, is how you okay. Do really really hold that thought just really but, but <laughs> they did some sort of sir i follow this sex um like sex expert on um on on uh, instagram <laughs> she said something like um men like two-thirds of all men can't locate a clitoris on the map of an anatomy of a woman this yeah that's scary okay keep going <laughs> <laughs> but you're right like especially and being you know uh with a a woman who i mean she was a, a lesbian, long -term lesbian long term lesbian long term lesbian so she knew what she was doing um and well and so did i it turns out <laughs> okay Okay, I'm going to stop you right there. Okay. Is that a lot of people when they've never slept with a woman before, they have a lot of anxiety about it. Mm -hmm. And you know what? The funny thing is, I don't know if you had any anxiety about like the actual act. Um, I had none because guess what, folks? All of us, sex is sex and you'll figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, don't don't like that's probably the least thing you have to stress about. Even if your partner mm -hmm. is more experienced than you, a lot of later, a lot of people who've been out a while don't mind showing people the ropes, but they're not really hard ropes to learn. No, <laughs> you know, so they're yeah. not. So, you know, don't stress about that. So you found out that you enjoyed the same thing and you enjoyed returning um pleasure to her yeah. just as much as receiving. Absolutely. Like we definitely clicked in the bedroom, but we also were going through this very powerful bonding experience outside of the bedroom. And she very, very rapidly became my whole world. Mm -hmm. And this is where I think, you know, so so as people, when when we're in that sort of that dating phase and that courting phase, we do a lot of things that help, you know, those bonding chemicals that percolate in our brain to help 
uh, form attachment and that's what we were going through our, our relationship transition from friendship um and i had figured you know we're we're already friends like you know i i know we're already friends i know we already share the same values i know we already care about the same things now i know that we really click in the bedroom so we should just really fast forward this into a relationship and at first it was very much about, you know, all of the, the wonderful bonding parts, but unfortunately it isn't until a little bit down the road when, you know, that sort of bonding phase is kind of over mm -hmm. and you start to transition more into relationship building, I would say, I, I think that's a fair thing to call it that it started to become really apparent that um, we were not compatible to uh, live together. For a long-term relationship. No, there's, there was no way. We were very, very different people. Um, there was, um, you know, and from my end, I felt like there wasn't a lot of uh sympathy for what i was going through as far as ending my marriage and it was not a topic that i could really approach her about because she'd get very angry very very quickly so i have a couple of things to say about that okay yeah, yeah. very normal if you're dating somebody who is coming out who has been out a long time and you're going through a divorce mm -hmm. and you are you're you know you're there's a lot of grief going on watch her listen to our grief episode yes and, and, and frankly, I'm going to say it, we're a mess. We are a mess. Yeah. Absolute mess. And so my wife wrote um, a really good article about if you are late in life, I mean, excuse me, if you are a long-term lesbian and, and, you know, you're in your forties and fifties and you're dating a newbie, mm -hmm. she gives you some really great solid advice in there. So we're going to, again, link this to the show, mm -hmm. but also too, I think the mistakes we made, Barb, is that is that because we were newbies in our relationships, because both of us dated long-term lesbians in the beginning, um, we are used to having women as friends. Yeah. And so the problem is, is that we talk to our our catalyst. I didn't have a catalyst or or you know, your girlfriend. Um, we talk to them like we would a friend, like a female friend, but this is the thing is yes, they are your friend, but they are also your lover. Mm -hmm. They are also your girlfriend, maybe partner. And so it's very painful often for them to hear about all the stuff with an ex-husband that maybe in the back of their mind that they may be still a little worried that you'll say, this is too hard and I'm going to return to him. Mm -hmm. And so all that worry is going on for the other person in that relation, in the relationship. So it's, you know, the thing is, is that I think that if you are someone new and you're coming out and you're dating someone who's been around for a while, find other people to talk about all the stuff that's yes. going on with you. A therapist, a coming out coach, join Lotus Group Coaching. Barb and I would love to help you. Yes. Um, friends, um, you know, Facebook groups, but really save your real, like, think of it. Would I tell my boyfriend this? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're new because we're just new. We don't yeah. know. Yeah. You ask yeah. yourself before you say to your catalyst or the woman that you're with, would I tell this to her if she was my boyfriend about my ex-husband or something mm -hmm. like that? Well, just, I you know, just that's a, another lavender flag information. Yes. <laughs> yes. And, you know, I really underscore something that you said there you know, talk to, talk to another friend, talk to your therapist. You know, I, I did talk to other friends for sure, but they were my straight friends. And so why they could give me a lot of, you know, uh, uh, sympathy or, you know, sympathetic ear. And I'm sorry, you're going through this. They really didn't understand like they, on a, on a, just on a more fundamental level, they didn't get it. So this is why, and I have said this to you, I don't know how many times, Anne-Marie, I wish I had had Lotus Group Coaching at that time in my life. It would have helped me so much to be in a community of people who were going through 
the same thing. Similar, yeah, similar things. But, Not everybody has a catalyst, but a lot of people do. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, for sure. It, it would have helped so much to talk to people who just have a deeper understanding of of um and coming in march barb barb will be doing some catalyst support groups within our lotus group coaching mm -hmm. so um just letting you know that you know if you're really struggling with the end of a catalyst relationship mm -hmm. there's a place for you absolutely and we will be we will be providing things for you when the all right so back to your story, you realize, okay, yeah, yeah. we're great in the bedroom. Yeah, we have similar interests, but yeah. we have nothing in common to make a long-term relationship. Hey listeners, if you're tuned into this podcast episode, I'd say there's a pretty good chance that you, just like Barb, have experienced a catalyst relationship. If your catalyst relationship has ended, we know it can be so very painful. If that's the case, first of all, big virtual hugs to you because i know how much it hurts when you break up with your catalyst it is so hard it is and i know because i have worked with hundreds of women who have had the same experience if you find yourself struggling to recover from the end of your catalyst relationship then barb and i have an opportunity for you that i think you really will love that's right so Anne marie and i will be holding an in-person workshop this spring that is exclusively for queer women, non-binary people who need support to recover from the end of their catalyst relationship. And we're holding this workshop in my hometown of Nashville, Tennessee from May 16th through 19th. And this is exclusively for people who have had catalyst relationships. You know, breaking up is never easy, but there is something uniquely painful about the end of a catalyst relationship that is hard for people who haven't experienced it to understand. And in this small group, and we have room for just five participants, everyone who is participating is in the same boat. They've all had catalyst relationships too. And you know what's really nice, over the course of the workshop, you can share your story in a safe place, be in the company of people who truly understand what you're going through, and learn tools to help lift yourself up and gain perspective on what you've experienced. That's right. And we're going to be doing some group work, meditation, exercises, but we're also going to have some fun too. Of course, you can't, can't come to Nashville and not have fun, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> We are going to go to the world famous Lipstick Lounge, and it's one of the last re remaining lesbian bars in the U.S., and we're going to take you downtown for some good old-fashioned honky-tonk fun. Yeehaw! Well, I can't wait. This is going to be such a blast. So if you need help getting over the loss of your Catalyst relationship, Barb and I encourage you to check out our upcoming workshop. The link to the workshop information page is in the description for this podcast episode, so just hit the link and you'll learn all about what we're doing and if you can please join us and if you can't that's okay we will have more retreats in the future and we can add you to our workshop retreat newsletter list join us make friends do some healing have some fun and be in the company of people who really get you just click that link below and we hope to see you at the workshop it, it really came to this point and we were living together. I had moved into her place. Um, and How quickly after you moved out of your husband's place? Out of, wait a minute. Oh, oh, patriarchy out of your home. <laughs> oh my God. That wasn't, I am, that, that was my bad. Oh, How, okay. oh, yeah. I don't know, Barbara, um, you could cut that or you could leave that in, but this was <laughs> Barb's home and her and her husband's home. So yeah. How long after you moved out of your marital home did you move in with your parents? Um, I would say I I moved out for real on July 4th, um, <laughs> but I had already been kind of going back and forth like to my mom's place. I'd kind of already done a trial. So all our, all our U.S. people are laughing right now because July 4th is Independence Day in the United States. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> Yeah, um, so I'd moved out on July 4th, and I think by mid-September, um, I got tired of, and we had we had collectively got tired of, of me going back and forth from my mom's to her place, and mm -hmm. so I just I just shacked up there, and uh, and to me this was like the greatest thing ever. I mean, yay! I I I'm I'm getting to leave the marriage that uh, you know 
had left me really deeply unsatisfied for a long time and transitioned directly into this wonderful relationship where, you know, it was feeding me in all the ways that I felt that I hadn't been fed before. It was, um, you know, still within the same community that I lived in. So, you know, I, I wasn't far from my kids. Um, I had shelter. I had, you know, I had security. I felt like I had hit the jackpot. But in, in fact, what I was going through was this deeply tumultuous, deep grieving, um, and what and eventually became a very, um, I don't want to say combative, but what, what would happen because we weren't compatible to live together. Um, I felt like, you know, she had a very quick temper and was always quick to anger and very confrontational. And I spent a lot of the time trying to change my behavior and what I did around the house to be able to placate her. And eventually the longer I spent with her, I mean, it's tragic. And I think this happens for a lot of women who have a catalyst relationship that starts to go is you work so hard and spend so many years thinking about leaving your marriage with your husband you go out and you have your independence day and you reclaim your independence but for me i was becoming a shell of who i was before i was i was robbing myself of independence by diving straight into this relationship and not only that but it was changing who i was and it to to placate her so she wouldn't be angry so what i found was i was doing like you know, scrubbing the grout on, you know, the bathroom tiles to make sure she wasn't angry because the bathroom wasn't dirty, um, ironing her sheets. Um, so you, you became know. her housekeeper. I became her housekeeper and it was complicated by um, a lot of excessive alcohol use. Um, I, I discovered after moving in pretty quickly that there was a lot more drinking going on than I had realized. No, she was basically a functional alcoholic. Basically, I remember just standing in the garage um, with so many alcohol bottles of empties and just crying because I, I hadn't realized that it was this bad. Um, so with with alcoholism, I think comes with with some volatility for sure. Um, I um, was hurt. Um, I I just became more of a shell of myself who walked eggshells around her because I didn't want to set her off like it could be something as easy as you know she had a towel for hand drying and a towel for drying dishes at her kitchen sink and if I used the wrong towel to dry my hands that could set off like an evening of argument and disconnect That's exhausting. It, it, it was it was exhausting for me it was exhausting for my kids when they came over because it was like I was they were afraid. walking on shells. Yeah. Well, true. Like I, I felt like you know when and when you have kids and my kids were thirteen and uh, seventeen at the time. You know, to have them come over and feel like, what if they put a cup down on the coffee table without a coaster? Like the anxiety over that was just sky high. I was um and because I was going through this plus, you know. Just to keep it interesting, um, I was also going through um, something at work where I, I took a leave of absence for work. I was being sexually harassed at work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the combination of the sexual harassment, the um, the difficulties that were seemed to just pop up in this relationship, I became quite sick and um, was having to, I had to take a leave of absence of work. Um, uh, you know, I was off work for six months. I was having all kinds of scopes and things trying to figure out what's wrong with me. But really, it was just my body, like saying, too much. <laughs> too much change, too much change. And also, too, I just want to um, note something. I noticed, you know, as Barb and I are talking here, her chest is starting to get super, super yeah. red. Yeah. And so all this trauma is can really be in our become in our bodies sure. and remembering this trauma and talking about this is causing 
um, Barb to get like all blotchy in her skin, mm -hmm. which is completely normal. Oh Everybody yeah. Okay. Has physical reactions to things. So if this conversation is causing you is the listener to have, um, some sort of reaction, you know, um, it's, it's, um, we may even put a, a little warning, like a trigger, warning. <laughs> a, trigger yeah, warning. a little trigger warning, because I can see this triggering my dear friend. Mm -hmm. And what I know is that when we get done with this, I'm going to really ask Barb to go out and take a walk, take a shower. Um, a really another wonderful one, a way you can embody is to like, you know, use your five senses to name something you can smell, taste, hear, touch, and um, see. And so like really grounding yourself again, if you're hearing this conversation and you're like, oh shit, I thought I was the only one. This has happened to me, mm -hmm. you know? So I just, and I also want to give you a lot of love, Barb, because I can own, I like, first of all, I understand how hard it was. I, oh, yeah. I really do. Um, I, I physically like crashed too. I lost 25 pounds when I came out mm -hmm. um, because of all the change and transition and stuff. So oh. I completely hear you. So how long did you live with her actually? It wasn't long. Um, I had moved in in September and then I was out by February. Okay. So, so you're like, this is not going to work. I'm not. Th well, first of all, congratulations. Well, thank you. That is really quick. Sometimes people end up, I just had a friend here who um, she U-hauled and she came back and she was visiting with us. She's back here. Um, she U-hauled to another state. And she U-hauled in December and she said to us, I should have left in February. Mm -hmm. And that was um, a year and a half ago. Yeah. So, you know, and she just moved back. So I want to give you incredible kudos for leaving a toxic situation. Well, that was yeah. damaging to you and your babies. Yeah, it was, it was absolutely... I mean, I could see the writing on the wall for sure. Um, one of the last things that we did together uh, as a couple, one of the last events that happened was her sister had passed away tragically, unexpectedly. And um, we went to the funeral and uh, instead of, and I, I knew it was happening. I mean, she was already spending time with this other woman and overnight a person who was a friend who is now her partner. Um, you know, we had gone to her sister's funeral and she sat me on the exact opposite side of the church where the funeral was. And so I can remember, like for me in my mind, that was like, this is it. Like partners sit together and comfort each other. Partners, partners are there for each other in these like really devastating moments. And instead of having me sit beside her as her partner, she, she put me way on the other side so while she was crying for her sister i was crying because i knew this was the end right yeah mm -hmm. and and then it pretty much happened like immediately after that in very tumultuous way and um and i went back to my mom's mm -hmm. and um i had my, my question is is um, I have a, like, just a question of curiosity about your catalyst. Mm -hmm. Had you been with a bunch of other women that were just coming out before? Um, I believe her, uh, her ex-wife was, uh, new to, like, she was mm -hmm. a late lifer too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes in the queer community, there are women that like to date married women. Mm -hmm. and 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 basically the joke is about the toaster oven right right um, you can read, it <laughs> read that article too in my blog my wife my wife wrote that one as well mm -hmm. um but it's almost it's very interesting it's like I it's not all the time once in a while you'll meet somebody and they really do just date married women mm -hmm. and sometimes a married woman leaves their husband for them Sometimes I don't, mm -hmm. um, but you know, it doesn't sound like your catalyst was, but a lot of times they have, yeah, a lot of times they do. And so that can be, if you meet somebody and you, she's like, oh yeah, I date married women all the time. 
Oh, that's you have to yeah you know the lavender you, have, <laughs> you have to ask yourself okay what scares you about being with a woman that's available to the cat right. the person who does that yeah. okay yeah. I got another question for you and this mm -hmm. might be a little hard one for you okay lay it on me did it make it easier to leave your marriage knowing that she was out there <sighs> yeah yeah I think it did I think, I think if I'm really honest about it, you know, I, I felt like there was this other possibility that was right around the corner waiting for me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she isn't the reason why I left. Right. But it, I, I would say knowing that she was there and that there was a possibility to start something there if I wanted to mm -hmm. made me feel like I wouldn't have to be so alone. Alone. Mm -hmm. And in reality, being alone would have been, if, if I could give a piece of advice to people who are, mm -hmm. are coming out later in life, and especially after a catalyst, take a break, mm -hmm. be alone, be alone for a bit. It might yeah. feel scary, especially if you've been in a long-term marriage and you don't have a lot of experience being alone mm -hmm. but that period of time that you take for yourself to learn about who you are outside of the context of a long-term marriage rediscovering mm -hmm. who you are it's mm -hmm. a it's a golden moment i feel and you can, and you can date and i mean you don't have yeah. to get into a relationship right away i mean i think i'm going to be really honest too is that i met my girl like she was my girlfriend and then my partner and then my wife yeah. but I met her right when I was leaving my marriage yeah. and I really thought I was going to be alone for like six months or a year or something like that I was really sort of looking forward to that time mm -hmm. now it's really I go both ways with it honestly I mean like I'm you know our marriage is relatively good we have our ups and downs but it is a good marriage um I believe my relationship with my wife has given me so many things, so many amazing things. And I think it really directed me into this work. Um, I think she gave me the crash course on being a lesbian because my wife is a very secure queer person. You know, she's done all the work years and years ago, mm -hmm. um, but I needed some time yeah. alone. You know, and so I really, it was really like in the beginning of our relationship, I really thought about breaking up just because I needed to be alone for a while, but we also had so many good things. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, and so I've made, I've made my peace with that. Um, but I do agree with Barb. I think it's really important to have, even if it's six months, you know, having some alone time when you come out of your marriage, um, if you don't, you will work your way through it and you'll have, and, and in four or five years, you'll say that was a good decision or, Ooh, that was a bad decision. It, you know, people do it all kinds of ways, mm -hmm. but I do agree with Barb. If you can have some time to yourself in the beginning, after you leave a marriage that you've been in for a while, um, and you're going from the straight world to the queer world, if you can have some alone time, I highly, highly recommend it. I, I really feel like that is a time if you can have that time where you get to, I mean, this is going to sound like I'm full of cliches, but reintroduce yourself to yourself, mm -hmm. discover who you are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe it's as simple as um, I changed the way I drank my coffee when I left my marital home. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. drink it the way he drank it because mm -hmm. that's how he prepared it, mm -hmm. you know, or, Hey, I don't like scrambled eggs. I'm going to start making my eggs over easy now, <laughs> but yeah. you always made scrambled eggs. You and I, you know, it's interesting when I did finally get that piece of time on my own, it came later. I did a lot of redecorating. I painted every wall in my house pink, mm -hmm. um, hung a bunch of chandeliers. I really like put visually put my stamp on my space to make mm -hmm. it feel like it was a reflection of me. And part of that was just a creative way of figuring out who I am and expressing myself and not having to ask anyone's permission to do it. It was my decision and 
I got to make the final decisions. I got to hang the wallpaper. I got to, you know, like, <laughs> and, and it felt so good to create that space. That was a reflection of me. But while I was working on the outer stuff, I was also processing inner stuff. Hey, Emery, you know what? I think that change can be a really good thing, don't you? I do, Barb, and I'm really excited when change can bring about a lot of good things for a lot of good, good people. Mm -hmm. So we are changing our Lotus Group coaching program a bit. Oh, awesome. Okay, so what's going on? Well, it's going to take on a bit of a different format after February 28th or beginning March 1st. It will have the same features as before, the groups, meditation, a whole course on a classroom platform, and a very active and friendly Facebook group. That's awesome. So what made you change it? Why? What's going on? Why did you want to change it? Well, the reason why I want to change it is we are transforming the Lotus Group coaching program so that we may reach more people in our queer community. So basically, I had to free up a little of my time. Oh, well, that's okay. That's good. Yeah, because change is good. Absolutely. So we wanted to give everybody a warning because a lot of times people think about joining Lotus Group Coaching for a very long time before they do. But we want to let you know that for the month of February, you are still going to get all, everything in the old uh, Lotus Group Coaching Program, which depending on what time frame you sign up for, you will still get three or six individual coaching sessions with me if you sign up now. If you are interested, if you're curious, I really encourage you to book a free discovery call and you can find that link in the notes of the show. Okay, so a discovery call is for the people who don't know. What a is discovery it? call is a half hour call that is totally free to you. You get to meet me, talk about what's going on in your life, but most importantly, you get to share your story with somebody who understands. And you know what, Barb? What's up? I'll let you into a little secret. Okay. Um, I have been told by so many people that they're talking about maybe not being straight. I was the first person they've ever told. Wow. Um, I know. It's really, it's really like such an honor for me. Totally. So if you want a safe, secure place to talk with somebody who understands, who will guard your confidentiality like a walled kingdom mm -hmm. book a discovery call today that's awesome and the sign up date for getting those three or six coaching individual coaching sessions with you the deadline for that is Mark february 28th february 28th. <laughs> okay good to know change is good change is good and so what was it like when okay you moved back home to your mom's yeah yeah what was the end of that relationship like for you emotionally? Um, I would say it, it was um, truly the hardest thing that I have ever gone through in my mm -hmm. life. Um, mm -hmm. I know when you have a blog piece about Catalyst um, where you say that you've never had your heart broken truly until you've had it broken by another woman. <laughs> it's, that's, yeah, that's I, I agree with that statement 150% for if sure. If you're gay. If you're gay. <laughs> if you're gay. Yeah. So, yeah, because we do, like there's, there, you know, there was nothing I could do to fix it. And I could, there was nothing I could do that was ever going to get us back to that magical space that we were in at first. Um, You know, so, it it was it was truly in I think the truest sense of the word devastating because I had lost my home. I was no longer living with my children. I was physically sick. I was taking a six month leave of absence from a job where I was not going to go back. So I was out of work. Um, a lot of my stuff. You know, I never reclaimed it. I'm, you know, still to this day missing things like baby photos and, you know, like I, I, it was almost like my life had caught fire and burned to the ground. And I spent a lot of days in bed with the blankets over my head in the dark, just trying not to, just trying to recover, just trying to cover. It was truly the most depressing 
um, most challenging time of my life, for sure. So how did you recover? Well, um, slowly, <laughs> yeah. but with, I, I, and I, this is the part where I could get emotional. It's the most important person in my life is my sister. Mm -hmm. So I would say she saved my life. I'm really lucky to have her. Mm -hmm. Okay, deep breath. Ooh. I, I brought these books out because um, she gave them to me when I was in that state. She got, she got me these. Mm -hmm. What are they? What books? They're called Good Night I... Songs for Rebel Girls. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I love these books so much. And they are um, they're children's books, actually. And they're all illustrated with by different like every illustration is done by a woman and it features women from history like from you know thousands of years ago to today who uh, have done accomplished incredible things there's amelia Earhart. hart nice one and, possible lesbian <laughs> there you go <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you helped me so much so there was so there were so many like so many amazing there were short short stories so actually being written for children for me at that time was probably not a bad thing because I also couldn't concentrate at the time, like, you know, just going through this heavy, heavy grief. And um, she gave me these books. She said, you know, I, I learned about them from somewhere. I had them um, for some, someone else and I'm going to give these to you and hopefully you'll find some inspiration. And have, reading these very short, easy to consume stories that are very, very inspiring. Um, once I read these stories, I felt like, oh, okay, there's been a lot of women out there who have gone through things that are much, much harder than what I am going through right now. They have been through war, they have been through disease, they have been through discrimination, um, they have surmounted the odds in ways that people would think weren't going to be possible, and they did it. So reading reading these stories really helped me to um think like put that idea in my head of if if they can do it i can do it i can do it right absolutely and that's what changed yeah. my mindset and i was able to move forward thinking i'm not going to feel like this forever i'm i'm going to be okay um, and I guess the other piece of advice, again, given to me, my, you know, my sister was, you know, um, inc just move forward incrementally. Don't feel like, you know, you have to consider like the whole problem was like, I have no place to live. I need a new job. Like, don't think about, you have to solve all these big problems right away. Right. Absolutely. Yes. Baby steps, baby steps towards baby steps forward. And then when you have like 10 baby steps, it turns into one big step. Well, that's, and that's the thing is that a lot of times I find with the client, our clients is that they focus, focus on so many different things. Mm -hmm. Only it's just one, one little step at a time. And, and I agree with Barb is like you to all of a sudden take a 10 um, little steps and you have a giant step. And mm -hmm. so you don't have to, if you're going through, if you've left your marriage because of a catalyst, and it's not working in, it's not working out and you're considering leaving your catalyst or you have left, um, you don't have to figure everything out at once. No. And this is also, again, you know, circle back to well, the kinds of support that you need at the time. Again, this is another reason why I had, I wish I had had Lotus Group coaching because mm -hmm. to work with a coach, not just like a therapist who helps you process what you're going through. But I think with coach mindset, it's very much about we're going to set a goal for you. Right. And how are we going to achieve that goal? Right. And that would have helped me so much, I think, to have that kind of guidance to getting those baby steps, you know, turn into. Baby well, steps. yeah. And the thing is, is that, you know, therapists are, are more, you know, I'm a big believer in therapy, but they're they help you process the emotions. They may link it back to. A certain ways of behavior, certain experiences and stuff like that. While a coach is much more focused on 
Um, my type of coaching is group coaching. So it's more focused on community mm -hmm. um, resources and what, like Barb said, planning more for the right now mm -hmm. and the future. Not and and I do obviously have counseling experience so that I can help you do some of the past work, mm -hmm. but it's really more about okay, how are you going to do this? You know, from the emotional spiritual standpoint, but from also the real practical standpoint of someone who's been there. Yeah, <laughs> you know, someone who's divorced in the United States, someone who's divorced in Canada. Yeah. You know, it is we have like really practical advice, and mm -hmm. so. Um, yeah, it's um, future focused, right? I like that. Yeah, it's future focused. And so a, a couple of questions. When I hear you talk about that time and I hear like how devastated you were. Yeah. Um, I was very devastated too. Do you have any regrets? Um, I don't regret leaving my marriage. It was something I had processed a lot. I regret leaving as quickly as I did. Mm -hmm. um, I regret, um, you know, if I could change it, I would have acknowledged those feelings that I was having for my friend and put a, and left my marriage and put that those feelings on hiatus, put them on the back burner until I processed leaving until you know, I had figured more stuff out for myself, um, you know, I could have left in a better way mm -hmm. than I did. Mm -hmm. So that I regret. Do I regret leaving? No, no, it was, I still maintain it was the right thing to do for me. Um, I, I wasn't willing to put up with more of the same for the rest of my life. Right. But, Oftentimes when people leave their spouses for a catalyst, the catalyst and the spouse have a lot in common <laughs> because as human beings, we are often attracted to the same type of person, whether mm -hmm. we're there in a male body or a female body, yeah. because it is all related to our primary caregivers. Mm -hmm. So that's a whole nother episode, sure. but yeah. it happens over and over. But I, I guess my question is, do you regret your relationship with your catalyst? And that's a tough question because there was so much about that relationship that was so damaging, but just to make it complex, there was also so much about that relationship that was revealing. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, I mean, it's possible that I would have arrived at the same realization without her. And it's also possible that I might not have. And I think what I have claimed in my life by by going through that experience was like i i'm grateful for the experience of learning that i have the capacity to love women the way that i do mm -hmm. and that alone has transformed my life greatly because you know not not only have i found greater fulfillment in relationships with intimate relationships with women, but it's also led me to the partner who I have now. Um, but it's also led me a little, it's met, it's led me to a more authentic version of myself. And I guess that's really the, the, the big reveal here is mm -hmm. that I've learned something about myself of how to, what makes me happiest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So and I guess in the end, I guess, no, I, I don't regret it. There were th some things about that relationship that were regrettable, yes. but I don't regret the relationship. And the reason why I ask that is because when people hear us be very honest, what this experience is like coming out later in life, um, it can sound scary. It's like, yes. oh my God, I don't want to go through all that pain. Oh my God, what if I start dating somebody that's not good for me? But like, you know, all these things. But this is the thing is I'm going to push back gently on Barb. I think you probably would have come out if it wasn't with her, it would have been with somebody else. Because, you know, because I think that the universe is always us calling us to be the most authentic we can be in this world. Mm -hmm. So eventually it may not have been right away but eventually i bet 
Mm -hmm. you may have, you would have met some, you would have met someone or, you know, dated someone or you would have divorced and then said, well, maybe, you know, try dating men. And then you're like, well, maybe I'll start trying, you know, date women who knows. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, is that yes, all of this was painful, um, for us, parts of it, parts of it were incredible mm -hmm. and joyful and, and, you know, and still continue to be joyful and wonderful. Mm -hmm. Um, just because something is hard, doesn't mean we regret it. And hard things are often the things that are most worth doing. And to quote Glennon Doyle, <laughs> <laughs> yes. who is a late in life lesbian. Yep. Her podcast is We Can Do Hard Things. We can do hard things. Yep. It was, I wasn't intending to bring Glennon in at the end. <laughs> it just popped into my mind when we were talking about hard things. Mm -hmm. And this is the thing is that, yes, you can do, if you're listening to this, if you've had a catalyst, if you may not have had a catalyst, but you're thinking you're gay and you're like, oh my God, what if that happens to me? May or may not. But this is the thing is that, I think from every experience in life, we always learn something, For sure. you know, and um, Barb's a big old gay now. Mm -hmm. So I'm very thankful. To <laughs> Thank God. <us. laughs> she came along and made Barb realize that she is not straight. Yes. Because what would I do without my co-conspirator? Oh, thank you. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> we're going to make the whole world gay by the time it's done, Barb. Because we glitter everywhere, Emery. <laughs> As unicorns, I'm going to go ride my... See, look, behind me is my, my little dragon slayer who rides a unicorn. So. Awesome. I love it. <laughs> Barb, thank you so much for sharing this incredibly touching and painful and joyous story with us today. I deeply, deeply appreciate it. And when we share our story, it lets other people hear their own. Mm -hmm. So for those out there who are struggling with any of this stuff, um, you are not alone. There have been people who've gone before you. Mm -hmm. There were people that went before Barb and I. Yep. Um, there's a long legacy of queer people in the world that have helped each other out. Mm -hmm. And if you are struggling and you're looking for a home, come and join Barb and I in Lotus Group Coaching. It'd be wonderful to have you. We'll take good care of you and we'll make this part of your life a little bit easier. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for joining us. We talked a lot today. Barb and I are going to make a little list now of everything we got to put in the links. <laughs> But first and foremost, we're going to go find that Katie Lang picture. Okay. Right. <laughs> yes. Enjoy. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye.